How's it going, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Debate Night. We are back once again. Got some returners. Got a new guest today as well. Um, not too too crazy, too much crazy things happening uh, this past week in disc golf, but we do have a bunch of great topics to discuss today. Some things from U.S. Women's. We're also going to go over um, just some topics that I generated myself as well. I think we got some uh, provoking, some thought provoking questions today. But first, let's get to each of our analysts today. Um, Brody Smith is back. Team Light Green. Yeah, just watched actually a Netflix show called On the Line where the bad guy name was Gary. That's probably the worst villain's name of all time. Um, other thing I want to throw on there, I read the comments last week. The comments were like, hey, Brody talks too much, too many rebuttals. He's being mean to the other guests. He's debating too hard. <laughs> I'm a man of the people. I'm going to follow my line. No rebuttals. I won't talk when other people are talking. I won't come at other people, and I'll be a nice little person over here because that's apparently what the people want. Rebuttal. Okay. Rebuttal. I don't think he can do it. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I can do it. Oh, Bernie I can, can do, do anything out of spite. <laughs> I can do it. Um, Rich is here today um, wearing some What's great happened? shades today. Yeah, you know, a uh, little fun fact for you guys. If you have one-year-olds, like to poke you in the eye when they have conjunctivitis. So my eyes are, <laughs> if you want to see, here's what my eyes look like right now. It's, um, it's <laughs> pretty, let me put the sunglasses back on. Um, yeah, it's pretty rough. So I figured, you know, I, I figured let's go full AB for this one. Got the chain, got the sunglasses. And I'm ready to throw far. Rich sent me a picture of his eyes earlier, and I think I jumped out of my seat. Like he he is going through it right now. The Anakin is accurate. Believe it or not, that is accurate. Um, <laughs> we're joined today by Gary. Gary's new to the show. Hey, what's up, guys? You know, Brody, I'd much rather be named after a Netflix villain than uh, everyone comparing me to the snail from SpongeBob. So I'll oh. take that. That is yeah. that is a good point. Although. I mean, Gary, Gary? Snails, a legend. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> pretty good. Um, and then we are also joined by uh, the superior Dustin today. Oh yeah. Coming off a big dub last time. Excited to be back and see if my uh, debate game can be as good as, as consistent as my disc golf game, which means I can finish anywhere on this thing. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's hop into the show today. Um, should be a good one. So I'm going to go into our first topic here. Um, it's March. March Madness going on right now. Everybody loves it. It's, you know, arguably the best postseason in sports. Uh, certainly up there. Such a great environment. If you haven't been watching basketball, even if you're not a basketball fan, what are you doing? Um, but in the spirit of March Madness and the electric moments that the seated bracket format creates, is there a way for Pro Disc Golf to implement a similar feel into the sport within a specific tournament or season-long format? Obviously, the old Pro Tour Championship format was very similar, but ultimately wasn't liked by the players. So I'm just trying to think, is there another way to get something like this into the tour, or was it tried, it failed, that's it? Brody, what do you think? I mean, I think the old format wasn't liked by most because it was like faulty in a, a couple of points, right? It's the last event. You potentially have a chance of having some of the biggest name players not playing on the final day, which is just a, a crazy thing to kind of think about uh, when you have just a select number of people there. I think people want to see all the best players at the end of the year duke it out. Uh, but I do think there is a place. I mean, I think there is a chance that one event, I, it's weird because they've tried this before, so maybe it didn't succeed, and that's why it's gone away. But I think I think you could have one event have this March Madness kind of bracket feel, where you seed out the <clears throat> seed out the players based off of their ranking in the in the Pro Tour Championship and uh, off the points, and uh, see where it falls. I mean, I don't. I, I think it's tough for them because they love trying to throw like two matches on the same card. And that's the dumbest idea ever. I don't want to see that, but as a viewer, I also don't want to see barely any action. And so if you end up having a bunch of one matches on all these holes, we're going to see very little action. They have gotten better though, with these standalone cameras. I'm loving the fact that I can tune in and see hole 17 hole one. I love that. And so I think that could actually help. But I think there's a place for it. Um, I don't think it's going to be everyone's favorite, but maybe in the future. Okay. Okay. So potential um, for some madness in disc golf. Rich, do you agree? Well, I, I, I think there's no reason for a bracket whatsoever. A bracket adds nothing. You'll get some 1v1 matchups that are blowouts. It's not interesting. You know who tried to add a bracket tournament to spice things up like March Madness? The National 
basketball association, a basketball thing, couldn't add a bracket. Do you, nobody cares about it. Do you even know what that's called? That ter- the midseason whatever championship? It's a useless thing. Now, Brody put a good point up there. Where does this go? I'll tell you where it goes. Mid-season event. This is not an end-of-season event. Let's have the World Cup of Disc Golf, where instead of a bracket, make it a group play, where you every single group, after day after day two, right, four-day event, after day two, the top two advance, the bottom two are out from their groups. And then same thing up, you group up as you go through the tournament. I think that's something where a full card is competing against themselves, against each other. There you create drama. And also what's really interesting about that is that cards play under the same conditions as each other. So if you're playing in the morning, you're playing dry conditions versus you're playing in the afternoon and it's all wet and nasty, that competition, that difference isn't an impact anymore. Now it's just you against the other three guys on that card, who comes out on top, who moves out forward. That I think could be compelling and give that extra sudden death do or die kind of thing. But overall, I don't think it's necessary. It's just fun and different. Okay. Yeah. I will say, I actually do agree. The um, one of the best things that come out of that format was the intercard matchup. I think that is uh, a lot of fun to watch because it's very easy to track. Um, all right, Gary, what are your thoughts on this? Well, as a former basketball coach, I love March Madness, go Tar Heels. But I think yeah. you have to look at the difference between uh, March Madness and disc golf. I mean, you're talking $15 billion in annual betting, hundreds of thousands of people attending the events, sponsors like AT&T, Capital One, 60 million brackets filled out, 10 to 20 million people watching the games. Look at disc golf. The PDGA tries to scrape by with a million dollars a year if they can get it. The top event I could find, 2022 European Open, 15,000 people in attendance. Sponsorships, Barbasol, L.L. Bean, and the Halal guys. Um, <laughs> the complicated Pro Tour finale layout that the players didn't even like. They had to change it up, and they had to explain it on every single um, broadcast, uh, once again, for viewers. And viewership of five to 10,000 like concurrent viewers at a time. It's, it's apples to oranges. The reason March Madness works is because it's fast-paced. It's unpredictable. It's for a limited time, which creates scarcity. It's extremely easy to understand, and it's easy to navigate. I can log in and watch any game I want, anytime, on any channel, for free. They make it available for everybody. Disc golf needs to spend a little less time, I think, trying to replicate these big events and make their rounds more palatable for their viewers, improve their pace of play, improve their video quality, work on their commentary skills. And with that growth, that needs to happen before I think we start uh, punching up at the March Madness level. I think it's maybe possible for a midseason event. Definitely, the it'd be fun and entertaining, but I think they need to focus on what they need to get done first. All right, fair enough. So Gary, Gary thinks many more problems to worry about before something like that. And uh, bonus point for the Go Tar Heels. Sorry, uh, everybody else. Um, so Dustin, uh, wrap it up for us. What are your thoughts on the March Madness? I'll put it this way. I, I, I don't think there's a way for them to do it. I don't think it's the way for them to to try to copy what college basketball is doing so well, because I'll tell you why. This is why I think most of y'all left out. It's not the format that makes college basketball so exciting. It's just a tournament, okay? Everybody plays tournaments all the time. There's chess tournaments. There's uh, all you, pickleball tournament. I mean, you can think of this tournament after tournament that you can go compete in. It's not the fact that it's a tournament. It's the fact that the drama that it creates. These teams... They know once it gets in that tournament, which does affect it, of course, but they are cutthroat. They have a desire to win. They know if they're one and done, they're out. The little guy can upset the big guy because it's one try, one effort. It's the drama that it creates, and that drama is not created very much in disc golf. Okay? It's not created in a lot of sports. You think about the NBA and how they drag it out over like a seven-game series. There might be drama in one game or two games, but for the most part, a lot of it's a snore fest. I want to see the drama created. And the way we got to do that is one, we got to improve production. We don't do it great already. The PDJ and the Pro Tour need to work on making it better and making it more excitement, some of the stuff Gary said. But we need players to understand. I, I, one thing I want to see different, and I saw a lot this last weekend, I'm tired of seeing players being nice to each other and giving each other high fives and fist bumps after each play. This is a game where you need to be cutthroat. You need to be pushing for the win. Let's see that fire. I want to see stare downs. In (laughs) MMA, if you get punched in MMA, you don't walk up, give that dude knuckles and say good hit and start to fight again. (laughs) You keep going. You intimidate. Bring that passion. Let's see it. Let's experience it. All right. So Dustin says more passion. All right. Oh, Brody, you have something to say? No rebuttal, but I have a question. Can I ask a question? Yeah, you can ask a question. I don't know. Can you? Probably not. I was going to ask Rich, Rich, did you say, I, I want to make sure I didn't miss it. You said that a lot of other sports don't have brackets. No, I 
I didn't think I say heard that. that. Okay. No. I thought you. Were, I thought. What, I don't. What did you say at the? I think you. I think what you. No, I said. That. That, I said that the NBA tried to add to add a tournament to spice things up in the middle of the season, yeah. and nobody yeah. even remembers what it's but, called. Okay, but the end of the. But then you said at the end. Okay. Okay. I say for us thing. Let's throw the NBA let, playoffs aren't a bracket. No, the NBA playoffs are a bracket, but that's already an established thing as opposed to trying to add this Create new, something. different, spiced gotcha. up type of gotcha. thing. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah, I saw your head almost explode. So I, you I know, was I like, every sport had a bracket. <laughs> 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 hey, hey, you're right. I mean, ultimately, um, you know, Dustin made a good point too. Like the the stakes of that college atmosphere are very tough to replicate because um, not only is it one and done, but you've got seniors on so many of those teams that may never play an organized game of basketball again in their life. And like, that's, that's everything out in the court. I mean, try competing with that. I mean, that's difficult. That's how guys like, uh, that Golki guy make drops like 30 hey, points on you. He's yeah. not being a car salesman though. He just did an ad read for some sort of like Bitcoin company or something. <laughs> Good so for him. Making, making bank. Pick up that NIL check. Yes, sir. Um, all right, we're going to move on. We're going to talk a little bit of U.S. women's. Um, nothing too much to draw from this. Um, you know, I think anytime we're talking women's disc golf and Kristen Tatar wasn't the winner, it's somewhat of a talking point. But um, I just want to ask, what do we think about Kristen Tatar's start to the season? Uh, do you have any reason to believe we won't see another dominant year from her, or is this nothing outside of normalcy for her? And then I also want to know, did we overrate her due to a lackluster field of competition? Is, is it, we you give her too much credit to begin with rich what do you think okay so let's look at her season so far Kristen got first at waco and then second at austin right that's her season so far and then last year she started a season with first at waco and fifth at austin the year before that she started off with a third place like clutch my pearls and call me martha wayne what are we talking about here why is there a washed conversation after a one-two start that's an insane conversation because she she wasn't closely enough chasing own in in Austin to make it a big thing because the U.S. Women's Disc Golf Championship she had a little bit of a challenge here. Like you're gonna have some off tournaments now. Is it great to have an off tournament at the U.S. Women's Disc Golf Championship? No, it's not a great place to have an off tournament. But the idea that that's the the deciding factor on where we're gonna suddenly go. Hey, the in my opinion, the most dominant player in the history of this division because of the way that the whole year runs, not just majors. I mean, look at the run from the last three, four years is absolutely insane. But we are such a what have you done for me lately group of people that were like, oh, one bad performance is the end of things. I don't think there's lackluster competition. I think you have some really great competition. I think you have really great competition that doesn't have the same consistency as Kristen has shown, and so they've given her some opportunities. But no, I think that Kristen's going to come ahead and put a ton of ones, a ton of twos, and maybe even, God forbid, a five or a six this year. Okay, all right. Too early to tell. Rich is not hearing any of that conversation. Uh, Gary, how about you? I'm kind of in a similar place. I mean, the first thing you got to do is you got to look at last year. Total dominance. 20 events, 12 wins. 60% of the time that Kristen set foot on the disc golf course, she won. 100% of the time, she finished in the top 10. To say that anyone's going to be able to repeat that or improve upon it, I think that's a large ask, and it may be a little unrealistic to say that she's going to just do that all over again. Um, and also, the field is getting better, although you wouldn't know it by some of the large names and where they finished at with U.S. women's. But the field is getting better. I mean, look at some of her chief competition. Missy Gannon, in the first three events last year, to the to the – the first three events this year averaged 30 rating points higher. Own went from 973 to 1005. Evelina, 950 to 986. Now, I know everyone has their feelings about ratings and where they stand, but when some of your chiefest competition are going up 30 and 40 rating points on average in the first three events, it's clear the field is improving around her. But here's the thing. We know that Kristen also said that she's she's busier than she's ever been before. She's away from family. She's having traveling woes, um, with passports and stuff like that, fatigue, sleep. Kristen's going to hit her stride. She's going to take a moment, take a breath. She's going to come in and she's going to win plenty of events and she's going to remind everyone who she is, that she's dominant. And one of the things that I think we need to think about here is Kristen Tatar may be even scarier now that the pressure of winning the Grand Slam is gone because now she's got nothing she's got to worry about. She can get some rest, come out, and she could dominate the field. And I think we're going to see that again this year and I'm not too worried about it. But I'd love to see other competition continue to press her. Okay, another vote of confidence for Kristen Tatar. Dustin, are you in the same boat? Um, well, I got some thoughts. I mean, first of all, is she was she overrated last year? And that answer is no, definitely not. Because 
I mean, the truth is she just made history. I mean, she's done something nobody else has ever done. She won all four majors, plus she dominated so many other events. No, we didn't overrate her. It doesn't matter what the competition is. When you dominate that in that kind of fashion, uh, you deserve all the accolades you get. Now, my next answer to what's going on this year, first of all, why are we, why are we playing a major this early in the season? I just don't like that. I mean, there's so much time. These, these players are barely getting back in the groove. You're just asking a whole lot of them to go in their off season and, and, and try to get some time away and then immediately come back and play in a major with that much importance. I just don't think that's the right angle to go. And I don't even know if I'm that sold in on disc golf yet to be where I'm ready to watch a major and be a part of that. But the biggest thing about Kristen and she's her own worst enemy in this is because um, she's not overrated because when you get that dominant in a sport or you get that dominant, in whatever you do, you're actually creating the fire that consumes and encourages your opponents, right? Because when you go out there and you play Kristen every week and she dominates you and she beats you, some players are going to react very well to that. And they're going to build that fire in themselves and say, I'm tired of getting embarrassed. I'm tired of getting second. I'm going to go work that much harder. I'm going to put that much more into it. And I think that's what we're seeing Missy and own and people do is they're coming with their full game. And Kristen's actually causing that just like the Patriots did it for so many years in the NFL. The bulls did it back in the nineties with Michael Jordan. I mean, how many players did he make better because of how good he was? Okay. All right. So everybody seems to be on board with Kristen here. Brody, are you uh, thinking the same thing? I mean, the real question here is why we call it the U S women's disc golf championship. And then we don't call it the U S men's disc golf championship. We just call it United States disc golf championship. That's the real question. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, other than that though, I, I thought her post, I thought her post was kind of interesting because she did like the, the typical paragraph, you know, had a picture with Missy congratulating her. But then she proceeded to do something that a lot of disc golfers do, which is list off, hey, I, I, I'm not going to make any excuses for why I didn't win. But here, let me list off all the reasons why I didn't win, which I don't know if I have seen that from her. Mm. I've seen that from a lot of people. I don't know if I've seen that from her. And I'm wondering, is that a little bit of a you know crack in the armor of where she is hearing everyone talk about how great she is? And now that she wasn't able to perform and let's be honest, she didn't play well at all. If you watch that final round, I didn't watch the first three rounds at all. I paid attention to the scores. I watched the entire final round. Missy did not play well. Evelina played terrible. It was, it was not good disc golf that final round. Someone, if someone played decent and was close, they would have won that thing. So um, she missed nine putts inside the circle she, she, uh, she only had 11 or sorry. She only had 10 birdie looks inside of 33 feet the entire weekend. That's... I don't know, man. <laughs> okay. All right. So maybe not, Hey, you know, I was kind of, I was kind of in the same boat. I haven't really seen that kind of post from Kristen either. And it is a lot, you're a lot more likely to succumb to the kind of excuse post. And like, listen, I'm, you were never going to sit here and be like, well, none of the like, excuses a lot of times are valid, but it, there's just certain people who won't list them. You know, a lot of great players just will never list an excuse. And it's a lot easier to succumb to that when you have all these people talking about you as if you are perfect in the sport of disc golf because she set such a high bar for herself last year. So I could see that being kind of a thing of like that, that it's a lot, it's a big act for her to follow year to year. It is just quick add on. I know people can flame me in the comments. One thing that is kind of missing too on ours and our, and like in disc golf is like Kristen Tatar would text you, Trevor, and be like, hey, this is what's going on. And then yeah. you, would, you would report it. Right. And that's way different with you reporting, hey, these are all the things Kristen's going through versus the actual individual either saying it in a press conference or sure. saying it on. So it happens in a lot of sports, but it just comes through a third party, which yeah. I think e uh, lessens the blow versus yeah. actually coming from the person's mouth. It is, uh, it is so true because, you know, yeah, it's a lot different than Adam Schefter reporting. Uh, my sources are telling me that Anthony Richardson is dealing with a sore ankle. You know the agent, right. that person's agent yeah. letting him know, like, oh, yeah. hey, he, he, had, he, he had bad sushi last night. <laughs> yeah. And, he, you know, he's having to go through some food sickness. It's a classic It's a classic sell to any team. Well, he was hurt yes. last year. He was hurt. Yeah. Yeah, he was hurt, yeah. Fire yeah. answer for real, though, y'all, for real. <laughs> yeah. They they don't mess around when you get yourself in a pile of those. And it is uh it is also too because like uh 
disc golf is just a sport that creates so much opportunity for players. Oh, I got all these spit outs, roll aways, mm-hmm. this and that. Like, I'm just imagine, uh, Imagine Steph Curry in the post game being like, "Man, the ball just wasn't the right weight today. Oh, I got so many off the back iron every time. The rim, the rim was like just not soft way at too all. Tight. Yeah, way too tight. <laughs> they blame the refs, which to be fair, that is like, true. That is true. I, that's a good point. Every wrong, other sport the blames time. the refs. So every like, sport <laughs> blames the ref, which is everybody again, needs a, an outlet. We all that's do. A third, that's a third party. That's way yeah. different than you know blaming certain things that everyone has to deal. With. As a Sacramento it, it, Kings fan, I'll say the refs are often to blame. One and only Kings fan right here on the show. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Yep. Um, There's one of us. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to the next topic here. Um, this is kind of just something I, I thought <clears> up <throat> myself. So um, historically, pro disc golfers have always been heavily associated with the brands they represent to the extent that it shapes their perception among fans and fills much of our discussion surrounding the sport. Um, you know, players such as Paul McBeth when he was with Innova, um, you know, is a good example there. Ricky Wysocki, you know, for a long time, he, he's moved around a couple of different places, but uh, players certainly become one and the same with their manufacturer. So my question here is, as our sport fills with more and more talented players with marketable personalities, do you see this effect increasing or decreasing will the emergence of star players only strengthen the visibility of the sponsor or will players become bigger than the companies they throw more often gary what do you think first of all i love the question i I was really excited to get a chance to answer this one first i think there are definitely icons in disc golf we can all think about for one of them for me is nate sexton whenever i think nate sexton i think everything traditional with innova it's just something about his, the presence he has. Um, but we have great examples of, of professionals navigating away from the icons they were you know, aligned to. You, you were in my head a bit there, Trevor. You got Paul McBeth, um, who said in an Innova commercial, I can't see myself throwing anything else. A couple of years later, boom, now he's synonymous with Discraft. New players coming into the sport, they don't know Paul McBeth from Innova. They know Paul McBeth from Discraft. Uh, Ricky, the world's best pig thrower outside Robbie C, a couple <laughs> of years later, boom, rocking slammers. Uh, think about the Crush Boys with Disc Mania. A couple years later, boom! Now they're creating, they're ushering in a new era of disc golf sales with a new company leading from the front. As the game progresses, I think there's going to be even better increased brand mobility for players. They're going to become better at negotiation. They may get agents. I think contracts are going to be crafted in a way that allows them um, to do what they want. Sponsors are going to have to learn how to do more with their players in less time. I think there's always going to be greatness associated with certain sponsors like Discraft and Innova and MVP, but there are going to be personalities that permeate the sponsors no matter who they are. Simon Lazat could be throwing a paper plate and I would still tune in to watch him do it because his personality goes far beyond whoever he's throwing for. Finding those players is going to be like catching lightning in a bottle. And the question is what sponsors can keep the lid on that jar? Mm, Yeah, very good. Um, All right, Dustin, what do you think? You know, I'm going to go with players. I think players are the bigger than the companies right now. And I think that's the way it'll continue to grow because when I go out, even when I was a kid back in back in the 90s, in my teenage years, and I was playing basketball, and I was trying to be like Jordan. I just wasn't wearing Nikes, you know. <laughs> you want to be – you want to be the player. And I think, especially with disc golf, and you're going to tell me wrong, I've tried discs for many different brands, okay? And I can't throw any of them far as I want to, right? I don't know if there's that much difference between the plastics and between the molds when it comes from brands to brands. So I think when you see really the difference makers and why one player is good, it's really easy to give the credit to the player. Um, and you can see consistency. You can see some players when they leave one company and go to the next that their play doesn't drop off that far. They're not all of a sudden just throwing really bad discs. Now, th- there are horrible discs out there. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes we get in so much uh, loyalty to the brand that we we forget that other companies make good discs as well. And, you know, it's funny because I'll go out and play with my brother and I'll throw, throw one of my discs and he'll hand me one out of his bag. He's like, try this one, you know, like it's going to be much better. And it goes just about the same. It's like, it's all in my arm. You know, it's not good enough and I want it to be better. But to me, the players, and then when you put the personality with it, the discs aren't going to have much personality. Some have better stamps than others. Uh, Some companies do a better job of that, but the personality of the players is what drive discs. Uh, Would MVP be where he is without James Conrad and Simon Lazat right now? Probably not. Uh, They'd still be a good company, but they wouldn't be where they are. And Discraft right now, I don't know how they afford all those people, but it's definitely obviously driving sales, and that's the personality of the players and not just the discs themselves. So can we get a terrible disc name drop? What's a, what's a Dustin terrible disc? Oh, <laughs> I don't, I, I've got to know now. <laughs> oh, God. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's probably any disc that I throw. I mean, 
Fair I had three, three my lightweight diamond one time and it went completely upside down. I just still don't know what I did. That's just, <laughs> <laughs> that's just what they do best, honestly. Um, all right, Brody, what are your thoughts on this relationship between player and sponsor? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's no secret. I've talked about this many a times and I honestly have really no clue what I, I've, I've fought for one side saying like, we need to get away from this. And then I've gone the other side saying, okay, maybe we go the F1 model where it's like, it's, we're talking about Red Bull and we're talking about um, Mercedes and we're talking about the brands more than the drivers or like that's what the fans care about. Um, I think until the players can make a considerable amount of money playing from purses, I think that will have a huge impact, right? When players start making $1 million a year or $500,000 a year, now that I think changes where right now it's the other way, right? The mo majority of players are making way more money on their manufacturers than what they're making from purses. Uh, I wrote down a couple things on here too, that I thought was interesting. One, is this a really big storyline? Do we care about this? Do we talk about this in the off season so much because there is nothing else to talk about? Literally, there's nothing else to talk about. Um, other thing, I think there's a massive difference between like Kirk Cousins going to the Atlanta Falcons in the off season and Gannon Berg going to Dismania. I think those two things are vastly different from one another, but disc golf a lot of times sees them as the same. And the last thing I was going to say is kind of, I don't remember who said it, but um, they're talking about how important it is for players. I'm going to go over my time. I, 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 I have a really good point, but I don't want to go over my time. I mean, I would have let you wrap it up. You were okay, almost let, there. Let, go, let ahead. Go, go ahead. Um, so if you pick up a new sport, you do not care who the stars are. You just go to a Walmart or a target and you buy the thing that you need to do go and you play. I think that's the majority of most people, but the diehards, those are the ones that care. So this idea that these companies have to put all this money and effort into players. I mean, look at Innova, they've done the exact opposite and I, they're doing just fine because they realize a lot of the people that are buying discs do not care. It's just the diehards of that sport that do care. Okay. Interesting thoughts. All right, Rich, wrap it up for us. I think Brody's last point actually sets off maybe the most important thing for talking about not disc golf globally, but disc golf from a pro tour professional competitive standpoint, which is that most people do not care at all about competitive disc golf. Most guys you meet on the course, they barely know the names of anybody. They buy some plastic, they throw it, they're out there chugging beers and maybe going to a safety meeting. They have no they have no <laughs> interest in who's top of the top of the rankings. And I talk, I'm trying to get people to play a, a disc golf fantasy pro tour game that I invented. And they're like, oh yeah, I've heard of the pro tour. That's the general response. But the truth is that for this to become uh, uh, the sport to grow competitively the way that we want. It's not a question of will it or won't it. It's that it has to because you can't have a sustainable sport with top tier athletes unless those athletes take control, are able to grab that that moment and grab that ability to be front and center because no one's tuning in to the people who watch disc golf right now competitively watch it because they want to see the game they play be played. We need to figure out how we get the guy who sits there and watches the NFL on Sundays, who's never played a lick of football. How do you make that same kind of person, a person who doesn't play disc golf a lot, follow the pro tour, or at least make a casual into that person. And the only way you do that is if they care about the people playing is if you look at somebody and you go, Hey, this person's success and failure matters to me. We need a tiger woods. We don't have one yet. Someone needs to come become that person. It's a very, very long road to something like that, but it, you're right. I mean, it is the key. It's the key to, you know, there's a reason that the PGA tour dropped their full swing documentary on Netflix. And I, I know for a fact, there are um, people who are following those golfers that do not care about golf because they got to look inside of the personality. And like, that is, that is a way to accomplish that. I think the key points here and everybody mentioned were a, you know, Brody mentioned the relationship right now between the manufacturer and the player is that the manufacturer creates most of the income. So they have the power in that. Uh, they can tell you, hey, you need to wear our logo, the largest on the back of your shirt and things like that. So I think that's uh, super important there. Um, but I think everybody had some uh, some good points there. Uh, Brody, do you have something to add? I was just going to say, if you look at the numbers and you talk to the people that are in tennis and in golf, uh, what what um, I'm blanking on the F1 one. What is that? Race to, Ra race? Drive to, survive. Drive to survive. Drive to survive. I was going to say yeah. race to survive. What that did for F1 racing it's it's 
what it's it's not even comparable to what is happening with the golf and the tennis ones. The golf and tennis ones bombed compared to what well, yeah, compared to I'm just saying everyone's trying to do that. Yeah. And there's just certain things like well, the, I think the we F1 all one wasn't in the American market successfully. Yeah, though, that's right? like the Those kicker, are sports that were already in the American I market. I, F1 I would, needed I, to grow. I would right. love everyone to be really interested in watching me open sports cards. It's not going to happen, brother. It's <laughs> well, not going to happen, brother. Yeah, to be fair, yeah, the <laughs> the thing about F1 is that yeah, it hadn't really been introduced to the American market and also it is just a fascinating sport and it's different than a lot of American sports. It's a playing sport. There's this, a reason this is a sport that you have to play to watch and like Well, but I would say like there's a reason that even a sport like uh, like soccer when the Premier League started to really catch on in America, a big reason why it did is because it was run differently. You could buy players and and there was no salary caps and things like that were attractive to to some of the American viewers and um, yeah, disc golf. We got personalities. We got, I mean, we got some characters. I, I, I don't know. We got to, maybe we need some more, but um, the barrier to participation oh. is also a lot different, you know, for F1. It's like, all I have to do to participate is I have to turn on a channel and watch F1. Yep. Yeah. You know, with, with, with golf and tennis, you know, you're maybe that person decides to go play golf once. And it's like, ah, nah, <laughs> Fake rebuttal, fake okay. rebuttal. <laughs> this is not a pseudo rebuttal. Pseudo okay. rebuttal. I love nice girl. <laughs> um, so, so Lance Armstrong, this is a perfect example to your Tiger Woods. A lot of people did not care about cycling. Point. Lance Armstrong comes along. Everyone starts talking about it. We're all waking up at four o'clock in the morning, or at least I was. All to watch the Tour de France. Um, the problem with that and the problem that golf has seen with Tiger Woods is when you build up a sport with that and then that person leaves or that poor person gets you know, uh, you know, in trouble with Muddied. the law, uh, uh, everyone leaves as well. It's a good so point. the idea of that is like, I don't think that's a great play to get like, Oh, we just need Burt Kersher to like start playing in tournaments. And now <laughs> please Bert- clip calling him Burt Kersher. That's the funniest oh. thing. What's his name? What's his name? Please, Kersher. please someone clip that and send that whatever to whatever his name is. Greatest. I don't think, I don't think that's the answer. I think, I think we just have to understand that. To, to get people to pay attention, they actually have to like like disc golf and then be sickos like us to want to watch other people play. <laughs> <laughs> I that's, mean, I will that's, say that's where we're at, brother. Yeah, the the path with disc golf too is because disc golf is so accessible. Like just like the fact that the the barrier entry is like almost nothing to play it. That probably is a lot. It like it is a lot easier for people to play the sport and then watch the sport rather than have to go out and play a round of golf or or go drive a car in a race, you know, <laughs> legally. So, um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. You know, it's the ever ever growing sport of disc golf, and we will see how it continues. Um, all right, we got one more topic here before our final round. We're gonna hop into here. So. Gannon Bird, Nicholas Antela, Anthony Barella, and Kyle Klein have clearly been playing the best golf to open the season by a comfortable margin. Of those four, who is the most likely and least likely to fall off that pace as the season progresses and why? Dustin, what do you think? All right, I'm in last place, yo, so I got to take a big swing right here to see if I can pull out a victory. But I'm going to tell you what, um, you know, Gannon, he's so talented. He, it's not him. He's he's going to be fine. Okay. Kyle, I was on the Kyle Klein bus in my last episode. I think he's one of the most underrated, consistent players out there. So it really boils down to, to Anthony Barello or Nicholas Antilla. And so I got to think, which one am I going to pick? And y'all remember, this is for entertainment purposes only. And uh, don't hold this against me when I'm wrong. <laughs> but clearly the answer is Anthony Barella. Okay? And I know I'm taking a shot because Trevor might just give me zero points right there for going after his his boy since he's the big fan club. But let me tell you, it's Trevor is the reason people like Trevor and people like Paul Uliberry and people like the commentators on the broadcast, y'all are all the reason I have to say Anthony Brella because every year for the last two or three years at the beginning of this season, y'all tell me how good he is and how this is the year he's going to take over and he's going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Okay. He is, he's great. He's so talented. I'm not bad mouthing him as a player, but every year y'all tell me this and every year he fades. And then he might come back up for a few tournaments at the end of the year. And then y'all start telling me next year is Anthony Barella's year. So I have to pick out of four really good players and four players that are playing lights out this year. I'm going to go with AB because y'all build him up too much with your hop. And then you always disappoint me and then tell me to wait to get until next year. So that's my guy. I want it to be Nick Loss because I'm so tired of hearing the commentators pronounce his name and like, they just want a prize. Like Ian and Philo, <laughs> like, it's, it's the greatest thing they ever do. When they say it right, they slow down. They use the act. It, 
It's terrible, guys. Just well, say his name and move on. It it is tough to pick one, but you are wrong, and this is different. Um, he won this year, Dustin. You know that it's different. He won this year. He won, yeah. Okay. So it's different. <laughs> I won the bank night, but I'm coming in last place today. <laughs> Good point. Um, all right, Brody. Who do you think is the uh, most and least likely to to fall off the pace? Yeah, I mean, I think most likely I'm going to agree. I think it is a B. Uh, looking at how his last year started, uh, he missed only one top 20 finish from the first 11 events. And then after that, the next 11 events, he missed six top 20 finishes with a 75th at Ledgestone, a 64th at Idlewild, a 70th at MVP, which I think actually might be last place. I think there's only 70 people at MVP. And then 50th at USCGC. So we have seen him do this in the past. His game out of those four people is the most volatile. Uh, when he's not driving well, and we've all, we all know he's a very streaky putter as well of where sometimes he misses a couple putts. And we even saw it at the end, he missed a big putt. Well, we didn't say a big putt. It was like a 20 footer, but in the moment it was a putt that he kind of needed to make and open the door on hole 17 at the, uh, the Florida open, you know, the chess.com open invitational. So we have, <laughs> we've, we've already seen it. I mean, there's too many names in these tournaments. Um, so we have seen it. I will answer the other one too. Gannon Burr, I think is most likely to keep up this pace. I think he's the most consistent of the four. His worst finish last year was the 50th at DDO. And also just watching him play his game travels because putting travels no matter what. I think he is actually the best putter on tour. Uh, cool. I think he was one of the better putters last year. And I think he's only gotten better. If I had the stats to give to you, I would, but unfortunately PDGA does not have season stats. Oh, shots fired. When are we going to get that new, uh, that new program? Who oh, knows? It's by Waco by Waco. They'll have it. Yeah. That was the old news. Totally. Listen, no, it's been updated. It, you didn't see the new article. They didn't no, tell us the anything. New article. The new article just says we're committed to working on it. And we're going to stick with this for now. They didn't Is put it, any that was updated from Waco. From the, when it, the it was the newest, be, it's the newest thing we have ever since. It's the thing they said after the Waco thing. So after the Waco, yeah, they're okay. basically saying now they did the, actually what was probably the smart thing, which is not give themselves not giving a, a timeline. Yeah. Right, right. Um, all right, Rich, are we staying a similar train of thought here? Uh, no, we're not. Let's start. Okay. Let's go through the list. Right. Let's go first. Gannon is too young to feel mortal. Uh, I saw some interview with him on Instagram. They clipped out a piece where he says the most embarrassing disc golf moment was that he missed a putt one time. Like it's the, the, that when you have that kind of, that's your brain. I don't think at that age, there's any sense of stakes, especially when you've already won, like at the highest level, I don't think that the stakes affect him in any way. So I don't think there's any point in the season where he goes, Oh, my game is off and starts feeling bad about himself. He'll have a pizza and mess around with his buddies on, <laughs> on other videos and he'll move on with life. Cause he's a child, right? Next you get into Anthony Barella. I think that AB that he's, he's, I think he had to look at last season and first, you have two things. One, getting the win off of his back is huge. But number two, I think he knows as well as anybody that he faded down the stretch. He's a professional athlete, right? And I, and I say this in a, in a sport where there are a lot of disc golfers and there are a few professional athletes. And not even to throw shade, but I think there's a big, we're starting to see that gap emerge. AB is going to make the correction on what he does throughout the year to make sure he doesn't peak midseason and then fall off on the back end. Right, so then we go to Nicolas Antila, who I'm going to go ahead and hit that with the full Philo hardcore pronunciation. And I think was I was between him and Kyle Klein. I think that Antila, if you asked me a week ago or two weeks ago before he'd won, it would have been him. But I'm going to go with Kyle Klein because I think that he has the he has a high ceiling, but I think he has the lowest floor production wise of anybody. With a lot of his finishes last year being pretty outside of the big margins, I think his floor is lower than those other three young guys. Okay. All right. Going with Kyle Klein. All right, Gary, round it out for us. Who do you have? Interesting. Cause we're going to switch it up a little bit. I mean, I like to look back at the, the four players too. I think they're all great. You know, Gannon had some issues where he kind of did the, the whole like up, down, up, down, up, down. He had uh, five different events where he finished outside the top 20, but still Gannon was a pretty solid player across the board. When you look at Nicholas um, last year, he started off kind of weak in terms of his finishes. And as the year progressed, he got better and better and better finishes started getting um, greater. Looking at Barella, I mean, Brody called it out perfectly. He had two back-to-back -back performances last year where he finished outside the top 60 and outside the top 50 with Ledgestone and Idlewild, and then again at MVP and USDGC. Klein, though, very interestingly, um, you know, he had a lot of relative consistency 
aside from one rough patch in the middle of the season, if you take if you take May through June of 2023, his average finish was 74th place. I'm not sure what was going on during that time of the year for him, but if you I take that out, me. yeah, there you go. If you take that out, his average finish of the season was 11th place. Um, so looking at all of that and how the competition in MPO is wild, I think my least likely to fall off is actually Kyle Klein um, because of that consistency outside of that that one you know sour patch. Um, he's got a lot to prove with Disc Mania's acquisitions. He's of the of some of the people in the group here. You know, you compare him to Gannon. He's still throwing his same plastic, um, and he has a solid game overall that I think works well with a lot of the different courses on tour. I think my most likely to fall off is Niklas, even though he had a great performance. Um, I don't think we've seen enough top tier play from him over a long stretch of time to know that he can keep it up. I really hope he proves me wrong because it was electric to watch him play and win that event. I think it's a good point. Yeah, I, I agree. I think Nicholas is so talented. I'd be interested to see him string together a season. Like we've seen patches. These other guys have been able to put together patches of seasons where they're just inevitable in the top 10. I'd like to see Nicholas do something like that. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the final topic here. Gary and Rich are moving on to the finals. Uh, Gary got a one point lead in his, his rookie debut today, putting together a show. I'm pretty excited about this last question. I'm interested to see what you guys have to say about it. Uh, Gary, would you like to go first or second? I'll take the lead on this one. Okay, Gary's going to go first. He's got two minutes up to 10 points available here. Here we go. Finals topic. We often talk about four-round tournaments being better for the reason that it allows the best players to rise to the top, a more fair way to establish the best player. That was certainly the case during the era when Macbeth and Wysocki were head and shoulders above the field, but is it still true? In the current MPO field with so many great players of similar skill, is it more about who is just having a good weekend and is three rounds a fair amount of time to decide that? Gary, what are your thoughts? I think there are some factors that change my answer. One of the big ones is would be, are we playing one course? We're we playing two um, because if we're playing one course, I think three rounds can be plenty of disc golf to, you know, have all the narratives come out, have the, the, the best players rise to the top um, with some storylines. If we're playing two different courses, I think it's going to come down to how those courses play. If they're similar, I think three rounds is doable. If they're very, very different courses, four rounds is great because it gives players with different skill sets, the opportunity to be competitive um, the same amount of time on, on two completely different courses. Um, I think that asking if it's players having a great weekend is a great thing because when players have great weekends, it creates an incredible storyline. It creates drama uh, on the tour, which is something that desperately needs something um, exciting. And I think it's good for disc golf and the players. I know that it was kind of flash in the panish, but Parker Welk's win last year. I don't think I've ever been more excited to watch a final round to see if this kid could keep it going and finish it off. Um, but I think over the course of the year, the cream of the crop will rise. So I think that's why it's okay for players to have pop-off weekends when we know the best players are going to consistently rise to the top. Um, one of the things that I think we should be asking about when we're talking about three rounds versus four rounds, the elephant in the room is injuries. There are a lot of injuries in disc golf right now. A lot of players, you know, not feeling the greatest going back to the post that they make. Are we putting too much pressure on players to go out and play four rounds travel get practice in and have to replicate that over and over and over again. Um, we need to protect our players, I think, and they're fighting injury and fatigue. So maybe four rounds uh, could be a bit too much. Maybe it could be good for special events during the year. I think at the end of the day, I think for the right event, four rounds make sense. But we should be focusing on keeping the players on tour healthy. We should be making those rounds as good as possible to watch. So instead of arguing whether it's three rounds or four rounds, let's just make three really great rounds of of uh, disc golf for the players themselves and for the viewers and um let's enjoy watching all those outliers fight against the top players for a chance to win and make it make a dream storyline okay some good points there yeah definitely can add to the uh the storylines you mentioned the parker welk win that was a lot of fun to to witness last year uh rich do you agree what are your thoughts on this I think we have to answer a question first is what's the objective of a disc golf pro tour event Right. If the objective is to find the best player from that weekend, the more sample size you have, the more likely you get the best player. It's great that players pop off and players can pop off over four days. But when you get that four day, that four day sample size, not only do you give players chances to make massive comebacks, as we've seen plenty of times before, you also eliminate randomness, you eliminate glitchiness, you take care of things like as we just come through this Texas swing. Wind and rain in the morning, clear skies in the afternoon, good footing in the in the morning, terrible footing in the afternoon, bad seafood, someone yelled something weird in the crowd, all these different weird variables that can throw off around. The more sample size you have, the more they don't affect or the lesser impact they have on who's the winner. So if the goal is who's the best that weekend, heck, make it five. That's why worlds used to be 10 days. 
right? Like the bigger sample size, the better you get. If the goal is to get your bang for your buck for the DGPT and have the highest level production and event that's the most entertaining, gets the most eyeballs, Thursday's not being watched by anywhere near the same amount, right? So again, this is all about deciding what are you trying to get out of it? If you're trying to get a tight, clean product, save hundreds of thousands of dollars on this budget that is uh, that is apparently struggling, then kill Thursdays all across the board, except for the majors, except for the big ones, and just make the rest of the tour something that will, of course, even out over the course of the year, but that's more of the entertainment side of the product and keeping the consistency of the product rather than trying to find the best person every single weekend. And, you know, you talk about these guys trying to take care of themselves. That's part of being a pro athlete. You got to take your ice baths and wrap yourself in weird tape and light some smoke and pray to whatever deity you made up that weekend. (laughs) Like you got to take care of yourself as a pro athlete, but it all comes down to what are we doing here? What are we trying to achieve? You answer that question and you get the answer to your question. Man, that was good, Rich. That was good. I, uh, I gotta say, I think you, you kind of hit every single, every single point on the head there. I I haven't given out 10 out of 10 points yet, but I'm, I'm going to do it today. Ooh. Wow, that was very good. As, I, as the the longer you're getting, Gary's having such a good show. The longer you're getting into that, I was kind of like, man, I I don't think I can avoid it. That was a very good point. Uh, yeah, I think you nailed it there. It is totally about what they're trying to accomplish. Like you mentioned, you know, nobody's watching Thursday. Um, you know, if it's about the end product, ultimately, most people most people are only consuming the final round, maybe the last two rounds. That's what they're going to talk about. You know, the next day at work, they're going to be talking about what happened in that final round of disc golf. Um, so it is, it is that balance. And, you know, you also mentioned Gary, which is valid over the course of the season, even if we're all playing three round events, those best players are still going to win uh, probably the majority of the tournaments. We have seen that be a proven recipe to get those tournaments to uh, uh, those, those players to win the, the good tournaments and, and kind of even out the season, but it does also create those, those fun storylines. So yeah, I, I was thinking about that the other day. Cause I was like, you know, that used to be, you know, so important because we almost felt like we had to we had to have justice for these players that are clearly better than everybody else. But these days, it's just not necessarily the case anymore. There are March definitely madness. Yeah, well, we yeah. were just talking about that at the beginning. March yeah. madness would be very boring if they did a best of seven series. It's true. It's true. Yeah, there's always there's always an alert to the idea that yeah, the best player, the best teams are going to win a good bit of the time, most of the time, but every once in a while, but not every, every once in a while, a, Parker Welk comes out, shoots FAU, the lights out, baby. What are we, who's going to be the guy this year? Who's going to be the guy? Any predictions? Who's going to be the, the 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 winner that nobody sees coming? I Paul Ulibarri. That's my guess. <laughs> is it I not? didn't win, so I won't. Uh, you don't get that information from me. <laughs> okay. Is it is it not Joseph Anderson already? Is he not the the? I'm the not surprised. I wouldn't the... be surprised. That's mm-hmm. the thing. Joseph Anderson. I'm expecting him to win this year. I'm not even. Joseph Anderson rocks. Be a surprise. Yeah. Joseph mm-hmm. Anderson's awesome. He's so good. <laughs> And Joey Buckets, that's that's marketable. That's marketable for sure. Um, all right, well, great show from everybody there. Rich, you're the winner today. Uh, Michael Jordan flu game. What do you have to say? Uh, well, first of all, in a moment like this, you could talk about a lot of things. You could uh, you could address some sort of social issue that matters to you dramatically. You could try to tell people to be better people and treat each other more nice online because, you know, there's some there's some infighting here and there in that disc golf Twitterverse. I'm going to do none of that. I'm going to be completely self-serving. As I mentioned, top of the show, I have a website that I do a fantasy disc golf pick em where you can win discs. But if you think you're smarter than me, which you might be, you might know more about this than me. You're probably look at this idiot with the sunglasses and this necklace. What does he think he's doing? Well, I'm doing hold my bag disc golf <laughs> DG.com. There you can go. You pick one player from the top 10, one from 11 through 20, one from 21 through 35 and so on and so on. And you have to pick players from rank 50 and higher to make your team and the best score each week wins a disc. We give you a disc for knowing more than I do about disc golf. So go check it out. We have a YouTube show too. hold my bag disc golf uh, DG on YouTube, but try it out. It's fun. That's the, that's it. Go ahead and win a disc and prove that you're the smartest disc golfer. I hope you can afford the invoice for $10,000 that Brody's about to send you for that, that ad. (laughs) No, no, that's fine. Free, free advertisement. I don't mind it. Only if, only if he wins, is that your, is is that where you draw the line? (laughs) Oh yeah. We'll cut his feet. If he doesn't win, he starts promoting himself. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, well, here's something. Here's something we definitely need to promote, which is uh, topic generation for this show. We'll throw the QR code here up on the screen. Uh, we've had a lot of people send in topics. I've noticed a lot of the topics. Um, we had a lot of topics submitted. I have been reading them. A lot of them are good Terrible. topics. 
No, there's a lot of good topics in there. Some people definitely put some satirical ones in there. I've read those too. But uh, there is a lot of good topics. What I will um, encourage you to do if you're submitting a topic, try and phrase your topic in the form of a question. Because, you know, the key to this show and, and developing the topics is we can't just talk about I can't just say talk about Kristen Tatar. I got to ask these 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 guest analysts something that may divide them, you know, something that that they can take sides on. So if you're submitting your topic, think about a question you could derive from your idea. What part of Kristen Tatar's game is holding her back? There you go. There you go. Good exercise there from Brody. Um, uh, but make sure to scan that or click the link in the description and submit your ideas because I do look at them every week and I'd like to include more in the show. Other than that, we will be back next week with another episode let it me know in the uh, in the comments was hashtag gary robbed or did rich deserve the win because it could be controversial you never Roberto! know we'll see we'll see you <laughs>